Hello everyone, welcome to the second part of the lecture on neural control and coordination. So, this will be part 2 of the lecture. In the previous lecture, we actually looked at uh, what makes up the nervous system. This is the fundamental unit of the nervous system, which is called the neuron. So, we understood how this neuron looks like, what are its various parts and also how does it function in the sense that you all know that the way the nervous system functions is through electrical impulse conduction. So, we learnt how the electrical impulse is actually generated within the neuron and then how it is coordinated and how it passes from one end of the neuron, the receiving end which is the dendrite towards the axon and then from one neuron to the other neuron, how is this electrical impulse transmitted. So, it is converted into a chemical signal at the junction between two neurons which is known as the synapse and then it passes on to the next neuron and your nervous system is made up of just a long chain of these neurons end to end which is like the wires in an electrical circuit and electricity is conducted through this long chain of wires from one neuron to the next. So, today's lecture is actually going to be a zoomed out view of the nervous system. So, we are going to look at how the nervous system is actually made, uh, it is produced, how are the cell, cells or the neurons arranged within this nervous system, so that it can function optimally. So, let us see what we are going to study today is the human neural system and as I told you before, the unit, the basic fundamental unit of this uh, nervous system is the neuron or the cell which looks like this. So, here you have the cell body and here you have the processes which make up the dendrite that is the receiving end of the neuron and this is the end that conducts the impulse away from the cell body which is called as the axon. So, this fundamental unit is repeated over and over and there are many of them which are all connected to each other and form this vast network which makes up your human neural system. Now, um, there are certain terms that I want to introduce to you. For example, when these neurons collect together in a bunch, they are, they look like this. So, in the entire brain that you have in the head inside your skull, it looks like this at a zoomed out view at a macroscopic level, but if you zoom in it is made up of these neurons, many of them bunched up together and then making networks and connections with each other through their dendrites and axons. So, uh, if you look at the collections of these neurons, say there are a bunch of neurons together which are all having their cell bodies in the same place. So, this part of the uh, collection of cell bodies together gives a greyish appearance, wherever there are collections of cell bodies there is this greyish appearance. So, this is called as grey matter and then you have the parts that have the processes only, they do not have the cell bodies because neurons can have very long cytoplasmic processes which do not have any nuclei or uh, organelles like endoplasmic reticulum or Golgi bodies in them, they are just made up of long extensions of the cytoplasm which are bound by membrane. So, these look like wires that you are familiar with in an electrical circuit. So, wherever there are these collections of wires running together, those bundles of wires are called as white matter. And the reason why they are called white matter because they have a whitish appearance and part of the reason why they also have this whitish appearance is because some of them are myelinated or they have um, the remember the cells that I talked about in the last time those oligodendrocytes or the Schwann cells they wrap around the sections of the neuron and this uh, region is called myelination and this gives the whitish appearance to this. And therefore, wherever you have these long tracks of axons running within the uh, brain, you, it is called as white matter and wherever the cell bodies are collected together, those layers are grayish in appearance, therefore, they are called gray matter. Now, in the human neural system is organized into two basic parts. So, if you look at it in a gross level, then the uh, parts that I am talking about are the central neural system which is abbreviated as CNS and the peripheral nervous system which is abbreviated as PNS. Now, I will tell you about what each of this comprises of right. So, the central nervous system first. 
So, the central nervous system comprises of the brain, I am going to draw a very preliminary cartoon of this and the spinal cord which extends like a long tube running down your back. Okay. So, this is the brain and this part is known as the spinal cord. Together both these things are known as the central nervous system. Now, the nervous system or the neural system just does not comprise of only the brain and the spinal cord. There are things called as nerves, which you all are probably at least have heard of if you have not seen. So, there are these nerves that come out like long wires. Some of them come out from the part of the brain and some of them come out in a long row extending from different parts of the spinal cord. So, these nerves together make up what is known as the peripheral nervous system or the PNS. And then the nerves are of two kinds as I said, the ones that come out from the brain part are known as the cranial nerves and the ones that come out of the spinal cord region are known as spinal nerves. So, together you can now see your basic nervous system can be divided into two parts the central nervous system comprising of the brain which is inside your skull and the part that is running down your back which is enclosed in the vertebrae or the vertebral column that runs down your spine. So, that part is called as the spinal cord together these two make up the central nervous system and the nerves that are coming out from this in going into various parts of your body are called cranial nerves and spinal nerves and together they are known as the peripheral nervous system. Now, let us look at it in even more details, particularly the peripheral nervous system first. So, peripheral nervous system comprises of two arms. The first part is called as the sensory arm, which is the afferent division and the second part is called as the motor arm, which is the efferent division. Let me explain each of these uh, one by one. So, the sensory or afferent part talks about the, that part of the nerve which can be a cranial nerve or a spinal nerve which brings information from the periphery towards the central nervous system. Okay. So, it is called afferent with an A and it transmits impulses from various tissues and organs towards the CNS. On the opposite end you have the motor part which is called the efferent part. So, whenever your nervous system um, is functioning, the way it functions is a three step process. So, usually there is sensory input coming in and then the sensory input is processed within the nervous system and then there is a decision taken about what stimulus. So, all living organisms are defined by their ability to respond to stimuli and the way we do this is through our nervous system. So, the nervous system has both these arms, there is an arm that receives the sensory information and an arm that decides on the output or whatever action has to take place as a result of this uh, re receiving the stimulus. So, that motor part is called the efferent part because it is going out from the central nervous system towards the periphery. In many cases it goes to different tissues and organs including the muscles. If the uh, response is going to be movement then the output has to go to a muscle. If the response is going to be secretion of some hormone or some other product from some gland then the output organ can be a gland as well. Okay. So, these two divisions are there within every nerve and just to explain this a little bit more I will show you a very basic circuit. So, imagine this is a section of the spinal cord. I told you that the spinal cord is a long tube like this. Okay. So, it is a hollow cylinder with a very small tiny cavity running through the end of it and if you cut a cross section through this, this is what the cross section of the spinal cord looks like. Okay. So, within the spinal cord you have neurons and you have the cell bodies of the neurons remember the cell bodies that looks grayish in color. So, here it is denoted as pink actually. So, you see the pink part this butterfly shaped thing in the middle that is where all the cell bodies of neurons are present. So, it is darker in color whereas, the surrounding region here which is white in color is the pia matter or white matter 
So, here is where all the processes or the axon and dendrites of all these neurons that are there within the spinal cord are present. So, imagine that there is one particular neuron present over here with its uh, process going out here and the cell body is actually outside. So, this is the sensory part of the uh, spinal nerve. So, this is one spinal nerve this uh, only I am showing you a representation here. So, you have one neuron shown here and another neuron here. So, one process which is the receiving arm of this um, neuron is coming from the periphery from your skin. So, there it is connected to receptors which can receive the stimulus. So, in this case this arm is touching a subject that is a, an object that is hot or cold. So, there are thermoreceptors at the end of this neuron which can stimulate this neuron. So, this electrical activity or impulse will be conducted all the way to the spinal cord through this uh, spinal nerve to, through the afferent arm of the spinal nerve and then the efferent arm will carry out the response to a muscle which is present in your arm because your response to this touching the hot object is going to be removing your arm away from it because it is going to burn you otherwise. So, it has to go to certain muscles which will contract and move your hand away. So, this together the afferent as well as the efferent arm together comprise of what is known as the spinal nerve. So, every nerve within your peripheral nervous system will have an afferent arm and an efferent arm. Now, let us see how there are different kinds of these afferent divisions and motor divisions. So, first the sensory divisions as I told you, you can have one part of the um, uh, nerve which is uh, an afferent part which senses the external environment. For example, in this case you have some thermal receptors which are present at the tip of your finger. So, that when you touch an object you can sense whether it is hot or cold right. And similarly, there are other uh, internal receptors that are present within your body not on the skin surface which can also sense internal changes in the environment changes in the internal environment and those are for sensing the internal environment. So, certain nerves will be having a sensory component that goes all the way to your periphery and certain nerves will have a sensory co component that goes into your internal organs. So, if there is any change in temperature there or if there is any stimulation through an irritant which causes some kind of irritation or pain that can be sensed by that sensory arm for the internal environment right. Let us now talk about the motor division. So, the efferent division can be also of two kinds. First is the somatic nervous system which has a motor component which is shown right over here. Here you see that this motor component is going to a muscle in the periphery. So, a muscle in your limb is what is receiving the output here. So, those are relaying the impulse from the central nervous system such as the spinal cord to the muscle in order to move uh, the arm. So, this is the part of the motor system which is going to the periphery. In addition to this there are some another part of the motor system which is called as the autonomic nervous system and I am going to discuss about it in more details in the next slide. So, the autonomic nervous system it transmits also impulses from the CNS, but mostly to internal organs because it is mostly involuntary. This movement that goes to your skeletal muscle which is there in your limb it elicits a voluntary movement which you have control over, but the functioning of your internal organs the contraction of the gut to make the food move down the food pipe or the constriction of the blood vessels to increase or decrease your blood pressure or your heart rate, your respiration all these are not uh, controlled by uh, voluntary control. So, there are involuntary processes and the autonomic nervous system supplies motor nerves to these smooth muscles that line these various pipes for example, the blood vessel or the wind pipe or uh, the other uh, gut tube everything is supplied by the autonomic nervous system. So, let us now look at a little bit more details in the autonomic nervous system. Okay. So, the autonomic nervous system can be classified into two parts one is called the sympathetic neural system and the other is called the parasympathetic neural system. 
these are kind of sides of the same coin, two sides of the same coin as you will see how they function. So, for example, the sympathetic nervous system is also known as the fight or flight system and the parasympathetic nervous system is known as the rest and digest system. So, this is very interesting because this has been designed for your body to respond to a particular situation. For example, if you are in a situation where there is imminent danger, for example, you are being chased by a mad dog. So, what do you need to do? You need to run away immediately or you are being chased by a, a robber who wants to rob something from you. So, either your response is going to be to fight and win or to flight which is running away. So, the sympathetic nervous system will get activated in that case. So, what does the sympathetic nervous system do? It is going to do a lot of different things. So, the sympathetic nervous system will do the following, it will cause dilation of the pupil. So, the pupil is this hole, if you have seen your eye color, the eye color comes from this central dark circle which is there in your eye which is called the iris. And even at the center of that, there is a small tiny hole which is the pupil. This is the opening through which light gets into your eye and I am going to discuss that in the third part of the lecture in this series, but today I am just telling you what the pupil is. So, the pupil, the how much of it is open is dictating how much light can enter your eye and where there is a dim light situation, you need to open up the pupil and when there is a bright light situation, you need to close the pupil a little more, so that less light enters. So, th in this way it is like the camera where you have this opening, where uh, you can open or close the opening to dictate how much light comes in through the lens. Now, here the dilation of the pupil, why is it important in a fight or flight system? It is important because when you are going to run away, you need to see properly. So, you need to dilate your pupil or open it up bigger, so that more light can come in, so that you can see better and see better either to fight with the uh, whatever is attacking you or to run away from it most efficiently. So, therefore, dilation of the pupil and there are these muscles that are present, if this is the iris and the center of this is the pupil and this is your eye, then there are muscles that are present like this. So, these are radial muscles, when they contract the pupil opens up and there are some circular muscles which are present like this, when they contract the pupil closes. So, the radial muscles are connected to the sympathetic system and when they contract your pupil opens up bigger. The second factor that happens is acceleration of your heart rate, why do you need that? Now, when you have to either fight or you need to run away, you need your muscles to have very good supply of oxygen and where will that oxygen come from? From the blood. So, the blood supply to the muscle has to be increased and that is done by both two things, one is the acceleration of the heart rate or your heart starts pumping faster or the constriction of the arterioles which pushes the blood into the muscles. Then the third thing that you need to happen at the same time is the dilation of the bronchi. So, what are these? The bronchi are the pipes that are branches of your main windpipe which is known as the trachea. So, the trachea is there in the center of your chest and then you have two main branches which are the bronchi and then they form many other small branches which are called bronchioles that go into the lung. So, if you want to fight or flight, you need more oxygen and for that you need to breathe faster, and you need to get more air into your lungs. So, therefore, you need to open up or dilate your bronchi. So, this function is performed by the sympathetic nervous system again. Now, the third function is the inhibition of the motility of the intestine. So, what is happening when you want to you know fight or you want to run away, you do not want your uh, system to be putting in energy to do towards di uh, you know, digesting your food. So, the digestive system is kind of shut down temporarily. So, what happens is the motility of the intestine is stopped for the time being. So, that is why you want to divert all the resources to fighting or uh, running away, so that this is what happens at that time. Then also the other thing is relaxation of the bladder, so the bladder uh, is uh, relaxed at this stage, because again you do not want to uh, diversify the uh, energy into other uh, activities which are not necessary at this point to uh, you know run away from the enemy. So, here 
let us then look at the parasympathetic nervous system. So, the parasympathetic nervous system does exactly the opposite. So, you get contraction of the pupil again by the constriction of the circular muscles. So, the pupil closes and then you get inhibition of the heart rate. So, the heart rate will slow down, you get dilation of the artery also your blood pressure will come down, you get constriction of the bronchi. So, that you are not breathing in as much air and not putting in so much effort into getting more oxygen into your system. On the other hand, it is going to stimulate the motility of the intestine and it contracts the bladder, so that urine can be expelled out. So, this system therefore, is called the rest and the digest system. This is because this is at the time where your other functions in the body have to go on, the other involuntary functions such as production of waste or uh, digestion of food and so the resources are all diversified towards that and the other things are kept at a minimum which are not required at this point of time. So, as I told you the functions of various organs are controlled through the sympathetic and parasympathetic system together which is known as the autonomic nervous system. And this autonomic nervous system also has a set of dedicated nerves which are called the autonomic nervous system nerves and they are part of the peripheral nervous system, but they are not part of the main cranial and uh, spinal nerves that I talked about before. So, you have your brain and you have your spinal cord and then you have some part of the central nervous system which is dedicated to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So, you have some origins of certain cell bodies within the spinal cord which end up and make a synapse in this other collection of cell bodies that are running parallel to your spinal cord. So, these collections of cell bodies are also known as ganglia. So, wherever you see the term ganglia mentioned or ganglion mentioned, it means a collection of cell bodies. So, these cell bodies are the second set of neurons which are going to take over the information and they go to various organs and supply the information there for the contraction of the organ and so on. And if some of them will be originating in the brain as well. Okay. So, what about the parasympathetic nervous system? In the parasympathetic nervous system, it is the same basic organization, there is some output coming from the central nervous system at various levels, but each of these have the ganglia present much closer to the organ. So, unlike the sympathetic ganglia, which are present in rows next to the uh, spinal cord this is the sympathetic ganglia, you have the parasympathetic ganglia present much closer to the organ. But there are two neurons, one set coming out from the central nervous system whose cell body is within the central nervous system and then you have an external uh, second neuron whose cell body is in a ganglion that is close to the uh, organ and here uh, the nerve then goes directly to the organ from there. So, this is um, a summary of the autonomic nervous system. And now you understand how your body has optimized the system to respond to different situations that may arise in the external environment. Okay. So, from now on we are going to talk about the main part of the uh, nervous system which is the central neural system or the CNS and the biggest part that you are aware of this is the brain. Okay. So, what is the brain? So, the brain has many many characteristics and functions. So, if you look inside your skull, the space is occupied within your cranium by the brain. So, this is the central information processing organ of our body. It is called as very uh, in layman's term, sometimes people refer to it as the CPU of the computer right? that runs our body. That is a very crude analogy and it is much much more sophisticated than a CPU and we are still trying to understand how our brain functions, we only understand very very little about it. So, it acts as the command and control system which regulates many many functions in our body. In the very first lecture I told you that 
for functioning as a living system, we need to coordinate various organs and their functions in order to respond to stimuli as well as to actually uh, maintain homeostasis. So, all of that is done by the nervous system and primarily by the brain. It also controls many, many other functions. For example, uh, the functioning of all the vital involuntary organs in the body, for example, the lungs, heart, kidneys, etcetera. So, they all have connections via nerves that go to each of these organs, which dictates the functioning of these organs. Then you have many other processes, which are physiological processes, which are regulated by the brain. For example, maintenance of your body temperature thermoregulation, whether you have to feel hungry, when you should feel hungry, when there is a lack of uh, glucose or uh, food available in your body, nutrition is not there, then you need to feel hungry. So, that is also generated in the brain. Thirst, similarly, when there is not enough um, uh, fluid intake, you have low fluid in the body, then you have to you feel thirsty. Then there is something called as a circadian rhythm. So, your body has an internal clock by which certain activities are taking place in a regular interval of time. For example, sleep is an example of something that is regulated by the circadian rhythm. You always feel sleepy at a particular time of the day and when you go to another part of the world where the day light hours are different from where you were before, say you fly from here to the US, there the when it is night here, it is day there. So, then your body's circadian clock gets upset and you start to feel sleepy during the daytime, because your body was tuned to that in India, where it, when it is night at that time, right. So, the circadian rhythm is also regulated by the brain and various other activities of endocrine glands, which we will see in the next series of lectures that I am going to deliver, what these functions of these endocrine glands are and ultimately human behavior. The sum total of all of this culminates in human behavior. So, this is also overall regulated by our brain. And then you may not realize this, but every sense that you perceive, every sensation for example, vision, hearing, speech, memory, intelligence, all of these are not sensations, these two are sensations are actually processed by the brain and the output of the functioning of the brain. Emotions, thoughts, these are all higher cognitive functions that we all attributed to the brain, which is the seat of all these high cognitive functions. So, before I tell you a little bit more about what the brain looks like, what are the different parts of the brain and what they really do, let me tell you how this whole thing developed or how this whole thing formed. So, all of us began our life as a single cell, which was a fertilized zygote, right. So, from this single cell, it multiplied to form many, many, many cells. So, this is the earliest stage of the embryo which forms many, many different cells. Now, within this, the cells start to become specialized. So, a group of cells will decide that they are going to form one particular structure, another group of cells are going to decide they will form another group uh, particular structure and so on. So, this process is called as differentiation. So, the process of differentiation begins at the very, very early embryo and even before the differentiation be, uh, begins, the embryo gets divided into three populations of cells, which are arranged in three layers. So, these layers are known as the ectoderm and mesoderm and the endoderm. So, the reason I am telling you about all of this is I want to uh, explain to you where your nervous system comes from. So, this ectoderm is the group of cells, which is on the outer surface of the embryo. And this gives rise to two structures, one of which is the skin and the other is your nervous system, right. So, ectoderm, so imagine that this is a sheet of cells. Now, the sheet of cells, I have drawn these as squares, 
with the central dot as the nuclei. Now, this sheet of cells is not two dimensional, it is three dimensional. So, if you look at the cross section of this, it will look like this, right? It will look like this. You are looking at it the thickness of this layer of cells. Now, what happens to this ectodermal sheet of cells is it folds like this. You are again looking at it from the side. So, if it folds, it will look like this. So, there is a depression in this sheet from running from the top to the bottom. And if you look at the depression from the side, this is what it will look like. Now, what happens to this depression? The two edges of the depression will come closer together. And then they will fuse. And what will you be left with? You will be left with a hollow tube and a sheet on top. So, this sheet on top becomes the skin, future skin and this hollow tube which you are looking at in cross section which is running below the sheet on top is the precursor of the nervous system. So, this tube is going to look like this and it runs from the future head end of the embryo to the bottom the tail end. right? So, it is a hollow tube like and the wall of this tube is made up of cells, a single layer of cells. right? So, this primitive structure is known as the neural tube and this is the structure is going to form the basis of the entire nervous system. So, the cells in here right now are not neurons, but they are going to become neurons later on and they are going to divide more and more and increase their numbers and give rise to neurons right? which will make up the walls of this tube and this tube is going to then form the nervous system. You are already getting an idea about how your central nervous system forms. So, this is a cartoon representing that tube and what you already start to see in the early stage is that different regions of the neural tube start to form bulges. Okay. So, they have cells that are dividing like crazy. So, they are multiplying in number and increasing in number and depending on how many of them are being produced in a particular region, the size of that region increases. So, imagine a balloon, if you are increasing the size of the walls of the balloon, the balloon will increase in size. right? So, this is what happens. So, this hollow tube starts to balloon out in different regions and then the top part of this tube becomes the precursor of the brain. So, this is called as the forebrain and then the another bulge over here is called the midbrain and then the rest of it forms the hindbrain. And then the part of the tube that does not bulge out at all remains like this straight is called as the spinal cord. So, now you have a fair idea about how the simple cylindrical tube whose walls is made up of just a single layer of cells can become such a complicated structure like your brain and spinal cord. So, let me explain a little bit more about what happens, how do you get morphogenesis, what is morphogenesis? Morphogenesis means giving shape. So, how does the brain and the spinal cord get its final shape? So, from a simple tube like this again, if you look at the cross section of the let us let us concentrate on the forebrain part. So, initially it was like a single opening like this and the walls are made up of cells. Right. So, now what happens? There is a dip formation over here. So, this thing dips in like this and then it dips in further and that ends up fusing with the bottom part and your single vesicle gets divided into two. All of you know that your brain has two hemispheres. right? These two hemispheres, the cerebral hemispheres came from a single end of a vesicle that was the forebrain vesicle. So, then it forms two, two, uh, two uh, divisions which are the two cerebral hemispheres. Okay. 
So, these two cerebral hemispheres will form over here, but the rest of the neural tube will kind of remain like this and here is your spinal cord. right? Now, let us look at what happens at the closer level, how are the neurons that will form the bulk of the central nervous system, how are they produced. So, again let us look at the cross section of any part of the neural tube, let us say this is the spinal cord part. Okay. So, this looks like a simple tube which has just a row of cells lining it. So, these cells are multiplying right. So, more and more cells are being added. So, another row of cells gets added on top. So, what is happening? The wall is becoming thicker and thicker and as the wall becomes thicker and thicker, the inside layer remains as what is known as a stem cell or a progenitor cell or something that is not differentiated, meaning it has not become a neuron, okay. but it can keeps on dividing, it keeps on multiplying and giving rise to more cells. So, biology is funny here division equals multiplication. So, you have stem cells and then you have these cells which came from the stem cells and they now decide that they are going to become neurons. So, they take on the shape of a neurons, they start to grow processes and then what happens is if you take a look at this over time because of the increase in thickness of the wall, because the number of cells are going up, you have the lumen or the opening that was the central hollow part of this tube becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So, eventually in the mature spinal cord, if you make a cross section through it, you will see that the cell bodies of many, many neurons are arranged within this central region and there are these white part which has the processes of the neurons. The white matter is here and the gray matter is here. right? So, this is how the neurons are produced that are going to populate the central nervous system. If you look at any other part of the brain, the same basic principle holds true. So, now you understand that when you open up the skull and you take a look at the brain, it just looks like this mass of you know soft tissue, but it is made up of millions of neurons that are packed together with their cell bodies arranged in collections of cell bodies which are called the gray matter and then their processes that are coming out from the cell bodies are all running together like fiber tracks which are called as the white matter. Now, let us see, so the brain it needs to be protected, it is a very soft structure which is a soft uh, tissue, so it is open to being injured from the any kind of assault that comes from the external environment. So, how is the brain protected? So, the first layer of protection is actually the skull. So, the skull is the bony uh, cavity in within which your brain is there. So, brain is housed inside this case which is the bony case called the skull and then other than that there is another layer of protection as well as function that is carried out by three layers which are called as the meninges. So, these meninges are three coverings that cover the brain. So, the outermost covering is called as the dura matter, the outermost layer is called the dura matter. It is very tough, so it is made up of fibrous tissue which is very tough, so it has a very um, protective function for the uh, soft uh, brain that is present inside. So, it, it you can imagine it like a Teflon sheet that is covering the uh, brain. Then you have a layer which is called as the arachnoid which is in the middle and then inside this you have what is called as the pia matter. So, this is almost completely in contact with the surface of the brain and in between these two is a space which is known as the sub arachnoid space and then there is a fluid which is present here which is called as the cerebrospinal fluid or the CSF. So, the dura matter is in close contact with the bone of the skull. So, this is the skull bone and then you have the dura matter here and then you dura layer here and then you have the arachnoid layer here and then you have the pia layer here 
and in between these two is a fluid. So, there is this brain which is kind of cushioned by the cerebrospinal fluid. So, all kinds of trauma by your head getting hit by something or the other is prevented from being injured because of all these layers that serve to protect it. So, from any kind of external uh, environmental uh, assaults. So, now I am going to talk about actually each of the functions of each of these various parts of the brain that I just explained. So, we will talk about the forebrain, the midbrain and the hindbrain part. So, here if you look at this simple neural tube that I just described to you which is present in the embryo and this becomes this hugely complicated structure that is looking like here. So, how this happens is, is uh, as follows. So, as I told you the simple tube got ballooned out into different parts right you understood that much. Now, these balloons have become very very big and bulging out completely and then the, the, uh, the wall has become so thick that to accommodate a large number of neurons it becomes very very thick and not only thick it develops a lot of folds. Okay. So, these are called the gyri and the sulci. Okay. So, the gyrus and the sulcus are there on the surface of the brain because if you take a, um, any uh, straight surface smooth surface it can only accommodate a certain number of cells. Now, if you make it folded then the surface area increases enormously. So, it can accommodate many fold more number of cells. So, in order to fill the to capacity the space that we have within our skull the, uh, the human brain has resorted to this folded structure. So, that it becomes uh, able to accommodate many many more neurons. So, this is why you see these gyri and sulci that are present in the brain. Now, other than this you see this gyri and sulci also in certain other parts of the brain which I will talk about later the hind brain, but in the spinal cord it is really smooth there is no presence of any gyrus or sulci. So, here if I look at the adult brain the part of the brain that forms the forebrain is here up to this. So, the two cerebral hemispheres and the part to which they are attached at the bottom which is this part is known as the forebrain. Then the part that is continuous with this part of the tube which is here is known as the midbrain. So, here is the part of the tube that is the midbrain and then the rest of the tube continues more or less straight except for one part that bulges out and again forms these gyri and sulci which is called as the cerebellum. So, this part of the tube from here to here is called the hindbrain and the midbrain and the hindbrain together is, is often referred to as the brain stem because it looks like a stem like structure on which this huge cortex is sitting. Okay. Now, to move on to the functions of each of these parts of the brain. So, the forebrain will comprise of three different parts called the cerebrum, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Okay. So, let us talk about the cerebrum first. The cerebrum as I said is this cerebral hemisphere. If you remember from my previous slide I told you that there was a single vesicle which bifurcated into two and this gives rise to lot of folds which eventually becomes the cerebral hemisphere and the inside space has really shrunk. So, while the outer space is covered by the meninges and there is a cushion of fluid around it to protect the brain the inner part also the space here has also got cerebrospinal fluid. So, the function of the cerebrospinal fluid is threefold. One it cushions to protect the brain, two it supplies nutrients to the brain tissue and three it also acts as an excretory system to take away the waste product or the metabolic waste products that are produced by the brain. So, these are the three functions of the fluid. So, it is present inside the lumen in the center of the brain as well as as a cushion around the brain right. So, this, this view of the brain that you see is if you take the uh, top view of your head your two cerebral hemispheres will look like this. So, 
So, these are the gyri and sulci that are present. Now, if you cut it like this from the center, you are looking at the one half of this from the inner surface. So, this is the one cerebral hemisphere and you are looking at it from the inner surface. So, the top part of it is this which is the cerebral cortex. It forms the major part of the human brain and th as I said before it divides into two halves which is the two cerebral hemispheres and then this outermost part of this is called as the cerebral cortex which has many many folds which are called the gyri and the sulci. Now, the cerebral cortex it is made up of gray matter and white matter. The gray matter as I referred to before is because of the collections of cell bodies of neurons that are present here. So, these form the gray matter which has a grayish color. Then there are specializations within this cortex although it looks very uniform to you just this mass of you know folds that are present, but there are different regions within, within this which are specialized for performing various functions. So, there are sensory areas and motor areas. The sensory areas receive the sensory information from the sense organs that are there in your periphery which I will discuss more in the next lecture. The motor areas control the function motor functions of the body. So, they send output to the periphery to the various and control their activity. Then also other than this sensory and motor areas which are shown in red and blue here there are many many other areas of the brain which are called as association areas and they are uh, responsible for communication between different senses for example, between vision and hearing between hearing and speech and lots of other things and also memory formation and communication in general takes place through these association areas. Usually the fibers or the tracks which means the collection of the axon or the dendrites they are the axons are covered by myelin sheath. So, they constitute the inner part of the cerebral hemisphere. So, the cell bodies are located in the gray matter and then the fiber tracks are located here. So, this is one prominent fiber tract which is present in the center. So, as I said you are looking at the inner surface of the uh, cerebral hemisphere right. So, this part is a central fiber tract that is running like this and it contains all the fibers that are going from one side of the cerebral hemisphere to the other cerebral hemisphere. So, this is called as the corpus callosum ok. This is a big long uh, sheet of fibers running from connecting one uh, uh, hemisphere to the other hemisphere. So, then I told you about the main cortex other than the main cortex the part that is below the neural tube part that is below the cortex. So, the thing ballooned out like this and then the part that is below it here is called as the thalamus. So, this is the thalamic region ok. So, the cerebrum actually wraps around the thalamus, but the thalamus is very important for coordinating sensory and motor function. So, I told you one of the important functions of the brain is to receive sensory information and to decide what the motor output is going to be. So, thalamus is the coordinating center for that right. It is kind of the gateway for both the input and output that goes into the cortex. Then below this thalamus is another region which is known as the hypothalamus ok. So, what you had is if you this is the cerebral hemisphere and this is the basal part of the neural tube ok. So, this part was the thalamus and then from there hangs another region extension of the neural tube which is called as the hypothalamus. So, this hypothalamus also has a bit of uh, bulb hanging from it which we will refer to later this is called the pituitary gland ok. So, this hypothalamus they will then continue the, the neural tube will then continue as the midbrain over here, but we are talking about the thalamus and the hypothalamus right here right. So, the hypothalamus lies at the base of the thalamus. The hypothalamus contains a number of centers which control body temperature and various other functions like urge for eating, drinking and other basic instincts are controlled by the hypothalamus. It also is very unique because it has a special kind of cells. So, this special kind of cells are called as neurosecretory cells. Why are they called neurosecretory? Because on one hand they are neurons, 
because they have electrical activity. On the other hand, they secrete hormones. So, they have these neurons have their cell bodies within the hypothalamus region, but their axons or processes end up in the pituitary gland, the back part of the pituitary gland which is called the posterior pituitary and it secretes hormones there which are released from the pituitary. Okay. So, we will come and talk about the functions of this uh, pituitary gland in the next series of the lectures that I am going to deliver on the endocrine system. Okay. So, let us go back to the other parts of the cerebral hemisphere. So, there are deeper structures that are located below the cortex other than the thalamus and the hypothalamus. So, some of these structures are called the amygdala which is the center for emotions. Then there is the hippocampus which is the center for learning and memory. Together with the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the hippocampus is known as the limbic system. So, this is involved in regulation of various different behaviors, for example, sexual behavior, expression of emotions, excitement, pleasure, rage, fear, all of this is controlled by the limbic system, which comprises of the amygdala, the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. Okay. Moving on to the midbrain, as I told you the part of the neural tube, which is after the thalamus and the hypothalamus, which is located here is called as the midbrain. So, this midbrain performs very important functions. What is it? It is called the center for, um, it is called the, it is the part of the brain stem, which is the first part of the brain stem after which you will have the hind brain here and through it runs this opening, which is called as the cerebral aqueduct. Remember I told you that the central opening of the uh, neural tube remains as this uh, space, which has the cerebrospinal fluid. The part of it, which runs through the midbrain is called the cerebral aqueduct. Now, the midbrain also has four swellings like this, which are collections of cell bodies called corpora quadrigemina. Okay. Then what is the function of the brain? Again, it serves as an integration center for sensory information. So, lot of sensory information like vision, visual information coming from the eyes, um, your ears are sending in auditory or hearing information, all of that is integrated within the midbrain and then passed on to the thalamus and then on to the um, centers of the cortex which regulate these functions. And also it regulates the movement, the motor component of some of these sensory organs such as the eye, your eye movement is regulated by the midbrain. And it serves as a relay station as I told you, relay station for passing on information to the higher centers of the brain. So, the hind brain, now we are left with the rest of the brain which will then continue as the neural tube below. So, it has three portions, the pons, the cerebellum and the medulla. So, the pons consists of tracts of fibers. So, this is the pons region here, consists of tracts of fibers and it has many, many centers within it, collections of neurons that regulate some very important involuntary functions like sleep, swallowing, bladder control, hearing, sense of balance or equilibrium, taste, eye movement, facial expressions and so on. Then as the neural tube was developing, the straight part of it suddenly had a part that ballooned out here. So, this ballooning out part again got its own gyrion sulci. So, this part is known as the cerebellum. So, this was the pons and then this part was the cerebellum and the rest of it is called as the medulla and then we continue as the spinal cord. So, the cerebellum has a very convoluted surface because again it needs to accommodate a large number of neurons and it is the center for controlling and coordinating movement and balance. Lastly, the medulla which is the third part and the final part of the brain. So, it is at the interface between the brain and the spinal cord. It controls many involuntary functions such as respiration or breathing, cardiovascular functions as well as secretions that come out in your gut tube, the enzymes that are secreted and other factors that are secreted within your gut tube. 
So, with this the forebrain, midbrain and the hindbrain you can see how the division of labor is taking place within this whole system. Lastly, I would like to talk a little bit about reflex action and the reflex arc. So, what is reflex action? A reflex action is an action that you normally define as something that happens really quickly. Whenever you are using the word reflex in, in English, you are referring to something that is happening very quickly and almost without thinking. So, that part is the important part that you are doing something without actually thinking about it. So, actually in function reflex action is something that is carried out without involving conscious thought. So, here the input and the output system uh, usually does not involve the brain because the part of the nervous system that involves thinking is housed in your brain. So, if the input to the central nervous system and the output from it bypasses the brain then it is likely to be a reflex uh, arc. So, this is an example of one such reflex arc which is limited to the spinal cord level. Although there are communications between these neurons that make up the reflex arc to higher centers in the brain, but this communication does not dictate the functioning of this reflex arc in the normal level. So, with by thinking you cannot actually control this reflex movement. Okay. Now, let us see what this reflex, move, reflex is all about. So, this is called as the knee jerk reflex. So, sometimes when you go to the doctor you can have had this experience that the doctor takes a special kind of a hammer and he hits your knee with it, hits this area. So, there is a ligament there you know ligaments are those that join two pieces of bones or, uh, or tendons are pieces that are between the muscle and the bone. Okay. So, in these organs you have certain nerve endings, sensory nerve endings which come from the spinal cord. Okay. So, the cell bodies of these are not present within the spinal cord, but just outside the spinal cord in collections called as ganglia. Remember collections of cell bodies are called as ganglia. So, these are called as the dorsal root ganglia. So, these are part of the spinal nerves. So, one part of the spinal nerve is the afferent part. So, this afferent part goes and ends up in this tendon or ligament here and it has a receptor at the end of it, which can sense mechanical displacement. So, when your hammer hits your ligament or tendon there is a stretch and this stretch leads to activation of this nerve. So, then electrical impulse is then conducted towards the spinal cord right and then this um, uh, makes a synapse with either another neuron which has its cell body right in the heart of the spinal cord. So, this is a motor neuron. Okay. So, this motor neuron sends its axon all the way to a group of muscles that is present in your thigh. So, when your knee is hit by this hammer your response to that is going to jerk your knee upwards like this. So, this muscle needs to contract right, this muscle needs to contract and this muscle needs to relax. So, to move your knee upward immediately in response to this hammer hitting this reflex arc is what comes into action. So, now you have understood how very basic processes take place without the intervention of the brain or thinking as we know. Uh, this just is a very simple example of how your nervous system functions. So, let us end today's lecture with a few questions. So, the first question is why are the fiber tracks in the CNS called white matter? So, this I referred to before already because these do not have any components of the cell bodies within them which gives the grayish color and is called gray matter and in addition to it, it has myelin. So, myelin gives this whitish appearance to the white matter. Then let us see what is the purpose of the reflex arc in the neural system. So, sometimes when you have to respond to a stimulus it has to happen really fast. For example, if you are touching something hot or cold you need to immediately move your hand away from it. If you were to spend time to think ok this is hot, so I now need to remove my hand away from it, it will be too late you will already have burnt your hand right. So, 
therefore, these reflex arcs have evolved in, in our nervous system to carry out such certain functions very rapidly whenever it is necessary. And this necessarily does not need to involve the higher parts of your brain such as the cortex. So, therefore, although the information goes to the cortex, the cortex is not regulating how, when to move your hand off because that would take too much time. So, your hand because of the reflex arc has already moved away. Then there is a question in the central nervous system what is the hierarchy of function? What do we mean by the hierarchy of function? We mean that there is uh, some things are above others. Okay, some things are bosses of others. So, what you have here is the spinal cord which from which is the hind brain is more superior to the spinal cord and from the hind brain the mid brain is even superior to that and then finally, you have the cerebrum or the cerebral cortex which is the most uh, at the top of the series. Right? So, this is what we mean by the hierarchy of function and very last which part of the CNS has neurons that secrete hormones. So, this I also referred to during my lecture the part of the hypothalamus has certain neurons which are specialized to secrete hormones into the pituitary gland. So, with this I end today's lecture thank you very much for listening.